fungal classification has gone through a lot of changes in just the last couple of decades. There has been new metagenomic studies that have shown new discoveries of groups that we should be considering fungus potentially, and then also new relationships between the groups that we already knew belonged in this kingdom. On the basal end of this tree, you can see that there are dotted lines indicating Cryptomycetes and the Microsporidians. These two groups were not originally considered fungus and have only been added to the fungal kingdom in the last decade. The reason the tree is drawn with a dotted line is because these evolutionary relationships are fairly uncertain and we're going to need a lot more DNA evidence to be able to figure them out. Previously, fungi were divided into groups based on their reproductive anatomy. And so everybody who used a zygosporangium to reproduce was put into the same phylum called zygomycota. However, that phylum was paraphyletic and thus wasn't showing the most accurate representation of evolutionary relationships. So that group, zygomycota, was actually taken apart and it was broken into two different groups. We have the Zopagomycetes and the Mucoromycetes. And so both of these used to belong to Zygomycota. And this is a very recent change. So as you see other resources or you study the fungal diversity online, you may still see a lot of sources using Zygomycota or Zygomycetes. In the past, there was also a division of fungus called the glomeromycetes. And this included many of the fungi that are involved with mycorrhizal associations. The glomeromycetes has been included into the phylum now known as the mucoromycetes. So what used to be a separate group is now lumped together with this group of mucoromycetes. The Cryptomycetes and the Microsporidians, we do believe, form a sister group so that they are the most closely related to each other. They are both basal, located on the top of this phylogenetic tree, as likely the first groups to kind of have branched off in the fungi kingdom. Both of these groups have been added to the fungi kingdom because of the key characteristic that they contain a chitin cell wall. The chitin cell wall is a unique derived characteristic of the kingdom fungi and the presence of this cell wall is one of the things that has us thinking well maybe these belong in the fungi kingdom. The Cryptomycetes group is a small group so far only known of 30 discovered species however the genetic evidence points towards this being a much larger group. These species are ubiquitous meaning that they're found in all sorts of different environments. Some of these species are found in aerobic environments, anaerobic environments. Some of them are found in freshwater. Some of them are found in saltwater. Some of them are found terrestrially on land. And they have been found globally all over the world. So it may indicate that there's a lot more of these species to be discovered. Here you can see the rosella spores. These are a cryptomycetes species, and they mostly are going to live as parasites. This one is a parasite inside of another fungus, and then often these are going to be found as parasites inside of protists as well. There are more species, 1300 microsporidians. These are typically unicellular, and they are parasites that live inside of other protists and animals. They typically have reduced mitochondria and also a very small genome consisting of about 2,000 genes, which is the smallest known eukaryotic genome. The Cryptomycetes do have flagellated spores, meaning that the spores do have flagella on them that they use to swim. The Microsporidians, however, do not have flagellated spores. They may have lost them somewhere along the line. They do, however, have a harpoon-like organelle that they use to stab and then invade other organisms so that they can parasitize that host. The next group on our tree is the chytrids. So the chytrids are a group of fungus that are also found ubiquitously. So these are found in genomic studies have also identified chytrids that likely live in hydrothermal vents and other marine or saltwater locations. 
the life strategy of kith kithrids is fairly diverse. There are several that are important decomposers. There are many that are parasites. There are two species in general that have caused global decline in amphibian species, so species of frogs and salamanders throughout the world, to the point where they're actually having impacts on these amphibian populations. There are several that are mutualists. So for example, they live in the digestive tract of sheep and they help the sheep to digest their food. These have also diverged early in fungal evolution, so we do see them kind of coming off of the tree early over here. They do have flagellated spores, so these flagellated spores are called zoospores. The prefix zo means animal, so you can see here's the spore, and then this is the flagellum that it's going to use to swim through the water. So we do believe that all of the kingdom fungi came from an ancestor that had flagellated spores. These are present in the cryptomycetes and the chytrids. They're not present in the microsporidians, but that could be that they had lost them somewhere along that way. Of course, they have a chitin cell wall. That's a classic characteristic of fungus in general. The next group is the zopagomycetes. Now this is one of the two groups that originally was called the zygomycetes, which is a group that we've now abandoned. At this point in the phylogenetic tree, we're going to start to see non-flagellated spores, and all of these more derived divisions as we go through this phylogenetic tree will also have non-flagellated spores. The zopagomycetes are named zo for animal because these tend to be either parasites or symbionts of animals. You can see here that this is called the fly death fungus and it has wrapped around the abdomen of this fly so they often can induce insects to perch up on a high branch and then the fungus can disperse its spores from up high to be dispersed by wind to make it so that they can find new victims and then continue their life cycle. They do reproduce with a zygosporangium. This is a sexual structure that is going to be a very hardy structure that can persist for a long time in dry or harsh environments. Our next group is the mucoromycetes. This is the other group that was originally included in the zygomycetes. This group tends to include the fast-growing molds. They can tend to be pathogens or mutualists of plants. The hyphae are co -anacidic. Remember, co means together, so these are going to be hyphae where there are no septa. And the nuclei are just existing with no divisions between any kind of cells. They are also going to reproduce sexually with a zygosporangia, and you can see this zygosporangium structure over here. So you can see there's one hyphae over here and another hyphae over here. When they meet in the middle, they produce the sexual structure called the zygosporangium. This is a dark black structure, and inside of here, the sexual spores that are produced are going to be able to survive for a very long time if the environment is not very habitable. So they're very resistant to freezing, drying out, and they can survive for a very long time. And then what can happen eventually is when the zygosporangium lands in a favorable environment, like the fruit on your counter or a loaf of bread, it will then germinate and reproduce its sexual spores. Here is the life cycle of a typical mucoromycetes. This is ripe zopus, which is the black bread mold. And most of the time, fungi are going to reproduce asexually. So the asexual structure for the black bread molds are called sporangia. And then this is going to produce spores by mitosis, which will be clones of the parent. When the environment is not perfect or the food source runs out, the fungus might choose to go ahead and with sexual reproduction. So we'll have our two mating types that will find each other. Again, they will fuse right here with plasma gamete, and we get this region right here where we see fusion of the two different hyphae into a heterokaryonic state. This 
group, the heterokaryonic state, is fairly short-lived, and it's going to develop into this highly resistant zygosporangium. Within the zygosporangium, we're going to see all of those haploid nuclei fusing together to form diploid nuclei. Uh, this is not one single nucleus. There are many diploid nuclei inside of the zygosporangium. Once the zygosporangium is in an environment where it will be able to grow, it will produce a new sporangium. However, this one will have sexual spores. These are going to be produced by meiosis. So each of those spores is going to be genetically diverse as if they were siblings instead of clones of the parent. These last two groups, the Ascomycetes and the Basidiomycetes, are considered the more derived groups of fungus. So the Ascomycetes is named for its sexual reproductive structures. So it produces sexual spores inside of a sac called an asci, and those are produced on fruiting bodies called ascocarps. So this you can see is the fruiting body of a moral, and then this is a fruiting body right here of a truffle. The truffles are actually underground, um, but these ones have been uh, dug up. This is an individual ASCII, and so that's this little sac right here, and then you can see inside of it that there are eight ASCO spores. So each one of those is a spore that will get dispersed to create a new mycelium. The Ascomycetes is the group that is most responsible for the symbiotic associations with either green algae or cyanobacteria that create the organisms called lichens. The asexual reproductive structure of Ascomycetes is called conidia. Included in the Ascomycetes are also unicellular yeasts. So this is a yeast here. You can see each individual cell is a new individual organism. The yeasts that you buy at the supermarket to make bread or to brew alcohol are going to be these yeasts that are found in Ascomycetes. This is your typical Ascomycetes reproductive life cycle. You can see that we also have an asexual reproduction. So instead of creating a sporangia, they produce a structure called a conidiophore. And on top of that, we have these structures here called conidia, and they get dispersed individually. Those can then germinate and create new hyphae. That will be a clone of the parent because that's asexual. However, those can also participate in sexual reproduction. So you can see right here that a conidia has landed on a different mating type hyphae. And so because they are of opposite mating types, they're going to be able to mate sexually. So we have the same processes happening here. Plasmogamy is the fusion of the cytoplasms, and that's going to create this ascus. And inside of this ascus, this is going to become dicaryonic. So dicaryonic is a special type of heterokaryonic. Uh, because these are septate fungi, you can see there's little septa dividing each of these regions so that inside of each of these septum are one nucleus from the first parent and one nucleus from the second parent, and they are divided out. These tend to have a prolonged dicaryotic stage. Eventually, some of these dicaryonic cells will have karyogamy happen, which is going to be the fusion into a diploid nucleus. And then inside that ascus, we can get meiosis, which will do result in our ascospores. And then those are going to be located on the ascocarp. This is the fruiting body of the mushroom. This is what you would see kind of above ground. And then it disperses the spores to be able to germinate and form new mycelia. Our last group are the Basidiomycetes, and these again are named for their sexual reproductive structures, which is the Basidium. Uh, the Basidiomycetes often look like a club, so these are sometimes called the club fungus. Uh, these are going to include your typical mushroom that you go to Publix and buy and put on your pizza. This includes the shelf fungus. You can see these kind of form like little shelves on top of trees. They're very commonly found on rotting or just decomposing trees and, and stumps. Puff balls, you can see the mushroom here, and then this is the poof of spores as they're dispersed. Uh, so any disruption of the puff ball will cause those spores to explode. Uh, this is the maiden veil fungus, and you can see this kind of structure coming off the side. These have a very 
distinct smell and they smell like rotting meat. The basidium is transient. So the actual fungus that appears above ground is only temporary. It appears, it produces the basidiospores, it releases them, and then it goes away. The main structure of the fungus is underground in the mycelium. So you can see here's a typical life cycle where we have two different mating types coming together. The first step is always going to be plasmogamy, where we have our cytoplasm fusing together. These are dicaryonic as well, so you can see there are several divisions here where each cell has a blue and a red nucleus, one from each of the parent mating types, and that is going to be divided. They also have a prolonged dicaryonic stage, and the ascomycetes and the basidiomycetes, because they have this prolonged dicaryonic stage, it's going to allow them to have many opportunities to have karyogamy happening later down the line. And so they're going to have many opportunities to fuse nuclei and then have meiosis occur to create distinct sets of spores. So essentially it gives them many opportunities for creating lots of genetic variation because they're doing a lot of meiosis. These basidia are found along the gills underneath the fungus cap of the basidiocarp. So you can see here each individual basidia. And so inside of each of these basidia, we're gonna see karyogamy occur, where we make these diploid nuclei. And then each of those nuclei are going to create these basidiospores that will then be dispersed by wind. A typical mushroom can have about 200 centimeters squared of surface area of the gills. If you notice, they kind of form this up and down structure that gives them a huge surface area. And a single mushroom can release a billion basidiospores that then get carried away by the wind to land and germinate somewhere else. This structure up here, you can see there is a circle of mushrooms that have formed on this, this green. And this is considered a fairy ring. And what's happening is the mushroom is actually, the mycelium is underground here. So the entire hyphae and mushroom takes up this location. And the fairy ring is the outer edges, where in here we have the center, so this would be the oldest portion, and then this is the newest or the youngest portion. And it grows outward in this circle. Over the years, these fairy rings will get larger and larger and larger after a rain, the basidiomycetes can send that water to the hyphae to rapidly grow mushrooms in the new hyphae regions. And so we see these mushrooms literally pop up overnight. And so because they're kind of effervescent and they're a little bit mysterious, they have received a bit of folklore about being fairy rings. Some fairy rings that are centuries old can actually produce enormous circles.